Okay, so welcome to our seminar this week. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Pablo, Pablo Arigi, who is um, going to talk to us about quantum dynamics uh, and, and graph transformation, hopefully in the, in the, in the context. Um, and he leads a group on, 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 on this stuff called Quox, uh, or Quox, I don't know how to, how to pronounce that, but uh, it's a nice, nice acronym anyway. Um, before we start, let me just say what this reminded me of when I saw the, when I saw the title, Quantum Causal Graph Dynamics. Um, so one of my favorite authors is um, Terry Pratchett, is a British science fiction or comic fantasy author. So some people describe him as a kind of, think of Charles Dick in writing comic fantasy. Uh, so that, that kind of combination. Uh, and he wrote a book called Pyramids, um, where he made fun, among other things, of sort of people having esoteric beliefs about pyramids, who think that, for example, they have rejuvenating effects. So, so say you put a a razor blade, a, a blunt razor blade into the center of a pyramid, and then it becomes sharp again. So apparently some people believe that. Okay. And he said, no, that is not true. Uh, the razor blade doesn't become sharp again. It's going, the, the pyramid sends it back in time to a time when it was still sharp and it wasn't blunt yet. Um, and no one that knows why the pyramid is doing this is probably because of quantum. So that was the, 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 the end of that phrase. And, and so this appears in several of his stories and it's basically the idea you can explain everything with quantum dynamics if you don't know the explanation is probably quantum okay so i'm go i'm looking forward to using that excuse myself in the future uh, if my graph transformation system doesn't work or behaves unexpectedly then i i claim it's because of quantum and i hope that pablo will give me some justification for for saying that so i can refer to him okay but sorry for the long chat um please pablo <laughs> introduction. Um, it's true that I've noticed that uh, when uh, some of my friends Google quantum stuff, they get lots of uh, strange things like uh, quantum medicine and so on. Um, so yeah, and when I Google quantum stuff, I only get academic papers. So hopefully, um, this talk, when people Google it, will come out uh, for the academic uh, uh, kind of uh, an audience. So um, I will be talking about quantum causal graph dynamics. The kind of objects that I have in mind when I say this is graphs that evolve in time and they evolve according to a unitary operator, which is the kind of quantum evolutions, you know, the, the kind of evolutions that are allowed by quantum theory. And therefore, they may evolve into quantum superpositions. And so you may find yourselves with quantum superpositions of entire graphs, not just the states within the nodes, but the connectivity of the graph may evolve. Perhaps the population, the number of nodes may evolve in this uh, quantum mechanical manner. Um, and so, yeah, that's the kind of uh, crazy objects that I want to study. Uh, just uh, bear in mind that, um, that so far the kinds of objects I've been studying are sort of synchronous evolutions of the entire graph, but under some uh, causality constraints that I, will, uh, that I will mention. So in that sense, there is this uh, synchronicity that, that, uh, takes a, takes, that makes it a bit different from uh, what is usually done in the rewriting community. Anyway, this is a, the stuff I will present um, during 80% of the talk today is joint work with Simon Martial. Simon Martial used to uh, do uh, his PhD with me, but now he's doing uh, research at Atos. Atos has a sort of quantum research center. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's it. Okay, so uh, during the talk, I will, be, um, I will be telling you about a series of theorems that all take the same kind of uh, form. They all relate the concept of causality with the concept of localizability. So because all of the results are going to be uh, of that shape, uh, we, it's better if we take some time to understand what I mean by causality and localizability. 
So causality first. What I mean by causality is, to put it very simply, the fact that information does not propagate too fast. There is a bound on the speed of propagation of information, the speed of light or the speed of uh, the fact that you are connected with some neighbors in a graph, but not with some others. Okay. Uh, but you see, um, the a causal evolution is something that, that can be quite, quite global. So a causal evolution can take all of these nodes into all of these nodes, for instance, there may be several particles that are circulating around, etc. But still, there is this causality constraint which states that the state of this node, and we have to be precise about what we mean by state, and I will be precise later on, but the state of this node has to be a function of the state of its neighbors um, in, the, in the previous time step. Okay. Usually, I'll be looking at uh, reversible evolutions, but I tend to put uh, forward that way and backwards that way in my, in my picture. So causality, that, that's what it says, that information doesn't propagate too fast. Now, localizability is a kind of constructive version of uh, causality. Causality is like a very axiomatic top-down principle. Whereas localizability is a more constructive, bottom-up way of saying kind of the same thing. So, so localizability is saying my global evolution from here to there is made up of local stuff, of local interactions. So it's kind of saying, well, the reason why things don't propagate too fast is actually because behind the scenes, there are local mechanisms that have these uh, little particles interacting. And so the global evolution really emerges from local interactions. Okay? And usually, it's very easy to prove that localizability implies causality. But it is this reverse way around that can be uh, quite difficult. OK. So these kinds of theorems have a bit of a history. For instance, they were proven uh, in the world of reversible cellular automata. If I think of this as a line of cells, like that, that's the configuration of a cellular automata. And this is a CA evolution. This causality constraint is the fact that information doesn't go too fast in a CA. OK. So these kinds of block decompositions of reversible cellular automata were proven first by uh, Jarko Cari. And during the talk, I will, I will give my own proof of Jarko Cari's result. They were proven in the context of quantum cellular automata, when these guys here are qubits instead of uh, cells. They were proven in this context by, uh, uh, well, by Reinhard Werner, uh, Schumacher in 1D, and then in, in higher dimensions by Reinhard Werner, Vincent M, and I. Uh, and I will sort of skip that proof. Then I, I, what I did is to look at a setting where it's not just lines of cells, it's graphs. And so it is the entire graph that evolves, but it evolves in a causal manner. That is, the graph is telling me who is allowed to talk to whom. Okay, so, so that imposes a constraint on how the graph is changing. And still, I was looking at reversible graph dynamics. <coughs> so I proved the theorem there, and I will mention that proof. And finally, um, there is the, <coughs> the quantum setting, which is a kind of, uh, if you like, uh, unification of these results. Uh, and, uh, and that's the things that I will be mentioning last. Uh, OK. Right. So that's the plan. Basically, I'm going to take, I'm going to show these results, but I'm going to take uh, that path here. 
So first of all, let me consider the world, the nice world of reversible cellular automata. So this is a, a configuration. My cells are either white or black. This is a cellular automata. <coughs> it's a very simple one. Uh, it's the shift. Information is propagating left, if you, if you, if you notice. And um, well, it has properties. It's reversible. It's, it's causal. OK, I wrote it in a very strange manner, perhaps here, but this is really what we usually mean uh, by uniform continuity, continuity, etc., in the world of, uh, of CA. So yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that perhaps in the, in the graph setting. But it's just what you, what you usually mean. OK, so I want, to prove, so I want to prove that this guy can be decomposed into local rewritings, into, into blocks. Okay, I want to, to give you a proof of Carrie's result. Okay. And at the end, the, the way I will implement it with blocks will look like this. So I'm going to prove to you that there exists a little permutation K that I can apply in that manner and a little permutation S that I have to apply at the end. And that the job that these guys accomplish is indeed to implement uh, my reversible cellular automata. For instance, you see that this triangle has moved by one. This triangle has moved by one. So I did implement the shift. There's nothing particular about the shift. I, I took the shift. Well, actually, it's the thing that's particular about the shift is that it's usually the hardest thing to do as a block. So this is why I took this example. Okay. okay. So um, the, the way uh, it's going to work <coughs> is, get, is that I'm going to prove to you that there exists a little permutation, a little local permutation that is capable of, of working out the result of this cell and storing it in, the, in this uh, ancillary uh, storage space here, the bottom triangle, right? Because I've had to augment the state space to do that, right? Now, there used to be just blacks and whites, but now uh, I'm, I've added, uh, 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 well, there's a top triangle and a bottom triangle. So you see this KU, this K, is capable of updating that cell. It's been able to sort of take this triangle and move it. So I'm going to prove to you that this guy exists and that it is local. Okay. So here is how I'm going to construct this K. So first of all, I will evolve everyone. So this is just the shift, right? I mean, these guys have just moved. Secondly, I will store the result that I was interested in by performing a little swap. And lastly, I will undo everything that I did. That is, uh, my, uh, my point was just to calculate this cell. So I didn't want all of the other guys to move. So I bring them back with F minus one. So you see that this combination F, S, F minus one is mostly doing nothing. That is, if I place myself far away, I see that the people have moved left and moved back. So this guy is roughly, this guy is roughly the identity. The only non-trivial part where it's doing something is around the swap here. So this guy is a little local permutation that was able to update this cell. And it suffices to apply this everywhere to update every cell. And you've got your, you've got your, your, your local mechanisms to implement this uh, reversible cellular automata. OK, so, so here I've shown, I've shown on an example how to, how to prove this, that that reversible cellular automata can be decomposed into blocks. And these blocks, they are themselves 
reversible, they are permutation. Okay. So now let me move on to the world <coughs> of graphs. And the kind of graphs that I consider are graphs where um, each node has a way of uh, knowing whether it has a neighbor on port A or on port B. So I guess there are zillions of uh, different names for those kinds of uh, graphs. Maybe they're called port graphs or, or whatever, but anyway. Uh, and so first of all, I need to be a bit more specific about what I mean by, uh, by causality, locality in these kinds of, uh, of contexts. So, well, to me, the, the, the topology, the neighborhood is going to be given just by the graph. I mean, I'm not considering embedded graphs. I'm just considering graphs. It's just a combinatorial structure. So, for instance, if I'm interested in the neighbors of this node in, um, in G, well, this is going to construct a disk, which is just that node with its internal state and also some information about who were the neighbors. And that's it. Okay. So now I'm able to state causality. What does causality say? So it's this formula here. It's uh, very short, but it takes a bit of time to pass maybe. I mean, it's, uh, so what is it saying? It's saying, give me any graph. Let's look at the image. So I take any graph, I look at the image and let's look at just a node, the node U. Uh, and yeah, I'm just looking at the internal state of you and with whom it's connected. You know, I'm looking at this kind of thing here. Right. Well, to compute that, I didn't need the whole of the, of the graph, really. All I needed was the neighbors of you at the previous time step. So, so I can replace in this formula, I can replace G by G U R, the neighborhood of you, uh, the, the R radius neighborhood of you uh, in G, and that suffices. And so, and so that's that's a way that's causality basically. Okay, and reversibility. Well, it's just uh, uh, this guy. Ha this guy has an inverse. Okay. So now I want to consider these beasts as a generalization of, uh, of cellular automata. I'm hiding some things under the carpet here. I mean, um, you see, as, as a graph evolves, maybe there was a node U, and maybe this node U has split into some infants, U.L, U.R, whatever. So, when I write this, I'm cheating a little bit. I mean, I should actually tell you what's happening with uh, the, the story of these names. I mean, uh, um, maybe, yeah, maybe uh, those are the infants of you rather than you, etc. Uh, I'm just simplifying this a little bit here, but, uh, but the point is, this is all handled uh, very well. We know how to do that. Now, the, the, the theorem uh, that I want to prove is that these guys, these causal guys, they are localizable. So, so this is a, a st something that is changing the entire network, right? It's changing the entire network in one go, but in a causal manner, right? Uh, not in a too crazy manner, like so this guy cannot suddenly connect to this guy, right? Well, we've, we're proving here that these people, they can always be obtained as a product of local reversible rewritings. That is, um, F can always be implemented as a product of Ks, and the Ks, <coughs> there are things that look at a node, they look at a disk, and they just replace only that disk in the graph, all the rest of the graph is unchanged. It's a local operation. 
and this disk replacement is a permutation of disks. So it's, it's a reversible mechanism. Okay, and the way you construct this, um, these guys is pretty much uh, in the same way as in the previous proof with the, with the shift. Like I was doing, I was doing F, some little operation and F minus one. That's still what I'm doing here. So to, um, to illustrate this theorem, we'll just give you an example of, of how it works. So, so here is, um, here is some dy graph dynamics, some reversible graph dynamics. It's a world of uh, port graphs with ports A, B, C, and D. And these uh, C ports, they kind of act like walkers. So, so they kind of move along the A, B ports. So I'm rewriting the graph that way. And there could be several walkers moving along and when they, uh, by the way, when they eat, when they reach an end, they uh, go on port D. So I wrote port D towards the bottom, but, but it's just a port. And, uh, and then they go the other way around. They go B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A. Okay. So I want to show you that this uh, <coughs> function from graphs to graphs, I can implement um, with those blocks. So the way the theorem works, I need an extra qubit, uh, sorry, an extra bit. I need to, I need to have, I need to paint my, uh, my, my nodes green and blue. Well, the, my nodes could have their, their own internal space as well, but I need a, a further bit in this internal space, space. So now I want to show you what, what, um, what a, K, uh, what a KU does. So um, a KU, well, is it KU that I do? No, it's, sorry, it's, a K, it's a KV. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a KV. So a, a, a local operation cent centered on V that is going to implement this F. So remember the definition of this KV is first you do F, then you do this little operation which kind of changes the color, it toggles the color of the extra bit that I had. And now it's like this guy is underwater. Nobody sees it anymore, okay? So when I do F minus one, well, it's like I reached the end. Uh, so, F, so if you think of what F does, it circles around like that. So F minus one circles around like that. So this is F minus one. So KV does this. Now I'm going to do uh, KU. KU, it does F, it marks U, and then it does F minus one. But F minus one cannot do anything anymore because this is a, this is a disconnected graph, the graph of the green nodes. The blue nodes, they are, they've, they've become invisible. So there's nothing left to do here. And so you see that my guy has indeed moved from here to there. So this product of Ks is indeed uh, implementing uh, the, the, the F, right? Okay. Anyway, um, <coughs> so just to say that we can prove causality implies localizability uh, for reversible graph, uh, for, for CA, for reversible uh, graph dynamics. And now let's move on to quantum causal graph dynamics. So a context where a unitary operator is acting over the, 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 the Hilbert space generated by the graphs, okay? <coughs> So, um, yeah, so first of all, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be obliged to, to be a little bit uh, quick on the details, on the, on the, on the formal details, uh, but, but, you know, first of all, in quantum theory, we work with Hilbert spaces. And these Hilbert spaces, 
they don't have to be of finite dimension, right? I mean, a qubit is a Hilbert space of dimension two, but I could take a Hilbert space of infinite dimension. This, this, it has to be of countable dimension, however. Uh, but if I take, if I consider the set of finite graphs, well, the set of finite graphs uh, with, um, yeah, with, uh, yeah, the set of finite graphs is finite as a set. It's a big set, but it's finite. Sorry, it's finite. What I'm saying, it's not finite at all. It's uh, countable. That's what I mean. Okay, the set of finite graphs is countable. All right. <coughs> so if it's countable, I can number on the graphs. And therefore, I can construct the Hilbert space where each graph is a is a is a one of the canonical uh, uh, orthonormal uh, states uh, of this. Um, well, it, the graph. What well, basically I'm just saying that the graphs they form the canonical orthonormal basis of this large Hilbert space I'm I'm taking, and that's what I'm saying. So anyway, so now we can superpose any graphs. Okay. Now, uh, la, I want to prove stuff like causality implies localizability and, and so on. But you see that um, now it's very weird because, uh, for instance, causality was this thing about information cannot propagate too fast according to graph distance. Good. But now you see that these two nodes are disconnected and they are connected in a superposition, in a quantum superposition. So what do you mean now by uh, neighborhood? I mean, the, na the, the very notion of neighborhood is, uh, is quantum. So the very notion of, of to whom I can talk to in one step is quantum. The, the geometry is quantum, if you like. So it becomes very uh, slippery to understand what causality means, what it means to be local, uh, and so on. Also, uh, you saw that in all of my um, my previous uh, previous results, there was this thing, there was this trick, where I was saying, I do an operation, I do a local thing, I do the inverse operation, and if these guys are local, are causal, sorry, if these guys are causal, then the whole thing is local. Like, if I conjugate a local stuff by a causal stuff, the result is local. And this was the main uh, mechanism, the, the, the main thing that, that made my, my proofs uh, to work, right? And so here, if I want to do the same in the, in the world of uh, in, in quantum theory, I'm going I'm to have to to be able to rely on, on something like that. If I have a causal unitary and I have a local operator, if I conjugate it, this thing should be local. Uh, this is true, by the way, in, uh, in quantum theory in general, but only when we know what we mean by causality and locality. And the point here, here we don't know what we mean. I mean, um, yeah, let me just emphasize this point. Uh, in quantum theory, nowadays, uh, um, the systems, they are quantum, but the arranged, the, the geometry, the arrangement between the systems, they are usually classical uh, in the theory as we, as we had uh, so far. So we've had to work on, on this thing. And we worked on this uh, with uh, Simon Martial, um, the co-author I first mentioned, and we ah, we kind of almost got it right, but actually there were there were some problems in, in in our paper, and um, this time I think we got it right in this paper here, quantum networks theory. Uh, it's an archive paper that we've put uh, um, recently, uh, and the the co-authors are Amelia Durbeck who. Uh, was doing her PhD with me in Marseille. 
and um, Matthew Wilson, who is finishing his PhD in Oxford at the moment. So now I'm kind of switching to this paper, by the way. So let me just... Um, Sorry, Pablo, before you do that, just, just a point of clarification that, 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 that Nick raised, which may be useful. So, so he says that when you say, this, the, the, when you say the, um, the set of finite graphs is countable, what you really mean is the, the, the set of isomorphism classes of finite graphs, right? Or is the set of concrete finite graphs also countable? I think you have to fix the... So by concrete, you mean whether there are names or not? Yes, exactly. Uh, so if you take your set of names, if you, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you if you name them from a countable set of names, I suppose you can still be countable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think you can. Yes. Yeah, Jonathan said said as much just in the, in the chat. Yeah. So we name them in a countable set. Okay, okay. But we take name graphs. Okay. Okay. So that's also. Um, uh, quite a big, uh, 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 <coughs> a big question that we had whether we should uh, superpose uh, um, anonymous graphs like I did in this picture just to simplify or whether we should su uh, superpose uh, as you call them concrete graphs we call, we call them name, named graphs maybe uh, and um, and it, yeah it was quite puzzling this question and in fact if you, if you do a bit of an opinion poll in the quantum gravity community, because these guys in quantum gravity, they, they are used to kind of uh, discretize the geometry and, and try and work out evolutions uh, over them. This is, this is actually the, the place where they, well, yeah, it, it's, it's not standard quantum theory, but this is a place where people uh, try, try and do these things. Anyway, so you would expect that they know how to superpose graphs and whether they know whether you need to put names on them or not. And it turns out that uh, the community is quite split on this question. If you talk to people from uh, causal dynamical triangulations, for instance, uh, um, um, they will tell you that you shouldn't put names. Uh, and if you talk to loop quantum gravity people, they will probably tell you that you should put names. Uh, but um, we wrote a paper explaining why you should put names. I mean, with something showing that something goes very wrong if you don't put names. Well, so anyway, so it's a whole topic per, per se. But um, let me go on with uh, what I had to say. So, locality. <coughs> so, um, what we usually mean by locality uh, over graphs is that some operator A is R local if you kind of you kind of you're able to write it as a non-trivial part that is acting on the neighbors of some of, of some node and uh, a trivial part on the rest like you're doing nothing on the rest now the point is this uh, definition is kind of broken because, because who is a neighbor of V? If this is V, who is a neighbor of V becomes a state dependent thing. So you could write this, but you don't know who D is really. D has become a state dependent thing. So this formula kind of becomes <coughs> becomes uh, meaningless. So what the, what you have to to do instead is to say that A is local if whenever it allows for a transition between a certain input graph to a certain output graph. Okay, so first of all, this guy is quantum, so it could allow for a transition between G and many other graphs than H, okay? But, but it, it gives you a number, it gives you a complex number for that, which is the amplitude of the transition. So this stuff here is the amplitude of the transition between G and H. 
Okay. And so we are saying that this amplitude must obey this form. And what is this form? This form is saying, well, first of all, uh, we are going to look at, at neighborhoods around V in, in H and, uh, and G. And we are going to be looking at the complements of these neighborhoods. So you see, now I'm, 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 I'm writing something that is state dependent, if you like. I'm really telling stuff about this precise G and H and decomposing those, those ones. And we, are, we have to say, well, because A doesn't act on uh, the complement, these two, they need to be equal if, um, if you want there to be a non-zero transi transition. And then the amplitude of this transition should only depend on G restricted around um, R and V and H restricted around R and, and V. I could have written this uh, just with... Um, Without the chi here, just it's it's yeah it's h restricted restricted uh, with the r neighborhood uh, around v. Okay, so that's that's what that's that's how you have to fix your notion of locality. Now um, there's other stuff that gets broken. So so for instance. Um, let me think of A not as a local graph transformation, not as, a, not as something that changes the graph, but rather as an observable. That is something that, uh, yeah, so something that I want to observe on the graph. So this is now, this is going uh, more quantum mechanical, but in quantum mechanics, you have to specify what it is that you want to observe. Uh, and you may observe it with some probability. And the formula for what probability, what is the probability to observe A, is given by this trace of A rho. And rho is, a, is a, the density matrix. It's what describes the state of your, of your system. Right, so, <coughs> so I don't know. I mean, this is this is the perhaps the I'm entering the most technical slides, and and there's only three or, of them. So, so so bear with me if you if you, if this is getting difficult. But so I don't know how familiar you are you are with uh, with quantum theory. The way we describe states in quantum theory, okay, it's, it's with vectors that are superpositions of kets. That's true, but if you do that, uh, you are not able to speak about the state of a subsystem because there is entanglement and blah, blah. And if you want to be able to talk about the state of a subsystem, you need to go to a formalism, which is called the density matrix formalism. It's a very well established uh, thing. Um, okay, and, and this is a formalism where now your states, they are matrices. There are matrices, um, and um, and uh, and then there is an operation which consists in you have a big density matrix that represents the overall state, and you want to take the reduced density matrix that corresponds to a subsystem. Okay. All right. So now what I'm saying is that is if A is a local observable, then the, the probability of outcome of A should only depend on uh, the reduced density matrix of rho uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that locality uh, of A. Uh, that's basically saying, uh, look, if I'm observing just what's on my desk, then uh, the results of my experiments will only ever depend, uh, will only ever depend on what's on the desk. That's all it's saying, really. Okay. And, um, but, so if you want this to be true, well, you, you, first of all, you need a notion of reduced density matrix. And the way you usually define a reduced density matrix is by taking a partial trace. It's a, it's 
a trace. So it's like taking diagonal elements only of a matrix, but it's a partial one. You do it on a, on a factor of a tensor. Uh, and the point here that I want to say is this again is broken because you don't know where to, to take your trace because you have to take it over the neighbors of V, but this has become a state dependent thing, blah, blah, blah. Same story as before. <coughs> and same kind of a fix. That is, we were able to redefine the notion of, of reduced density matrix so that it works, so that this lemma works again. And so what you have to say is, if you have two graphs and you want to take the reduced density matrix, Ah, what you have to say is, okay, row is a matrix. So in general, its basic elements are of that form. So let me define this reduced density matrix on the elements of that form. Well, how do I do that? Uh, what I want to do is trace out what's not in the neighborhood and keep what's in the neighborhood. And um, that becomes a state dependent definition and the point is, is, is that it works. I mean, the mathematics works. And, um, <coughs> and in particular, you can use this setting to define causality. So if you have a unitary operator, it will evolve a state according to u, rho, u dagger. That's standard quantum mechanics. If you say that this is causal, you have to say that if I Montres, if I'm if I am only interested in, in the neighborhood of a vertex V, well, in order to compute that, I just needed the reduced density matrix around V. So basically, same logic as uh, causality over graphs, uh, phrased in a quantum mechanical manner, and. At that stage, you can, you know, all of these definitions, they, they work together well. And you are able to prove that if U is causal and A is local, U, A, U dagger is local. It is this sort of con conjugacy property that I was looking for, which is the one that's going to allow me to prove the same causality implies localizability theorem, where I decompose U as a product of local stuff. So, I mean, the, the story that this is saying is that any unitary operator over entire graphs to entire graphs, but that doesn't propagate information too fast, too fast, can actually be decomposed into little, little unitary rewritings of the graph. That is steps where if you look at a graph, this guy is only going to take a disk and modify it, but it will modify it in a quantum manner. It may, it may put some disk in a superposition with some other in this place and leave the rest unchanged. Okay, so that closes this, uh, this loop here. And but perhaps the, the, the most significant result here is not so much that uh, we've managed to close this loop. Uh, it is also that we've managed to make sense of uh, causality and localizability in, a, in the context of superpositions of graphs. Okay. Excuse me, another question maybe that we can sort of get in here. So um, Jonathan asks, what determines the degree of non-Cartesian-ness of your tensor product here? Non-Cartesian-ness, ah, okay. It's, uh, the, it's... The, de the degree of non-Cartesian-ness. Maybe Jonathan can sort of elaborate himself. Uh, it's a good question. Yeah, sure. I mean, so, so as I understand, your, your tensor product construction is just over this Hilbert space of, of um, finite labeled graphs is kind of based on a graph union or based on a, um, 
it's based on the union of vertex sets and then sort of a canonical extension of the edge set. Is that right? Um, it's based on. Um, okay, so, so you're, you're entering me. You're, you're making me enter uh, into into uh, this paper here uh, mm -hmm. with your question, Jonathan, uh, which I was sort of trying to avoid uh, at this stage, <laughs> but. Um, because you see, I didn't really use the tensor product in what I was uh, stating so far. Uh, Ex except implicitly in your construction of the density matrices and the, and the partial trace, right? Because I, I'm, the, the, thing, the thing I'm wondering is, you know, under what conditions so, do you actually need density matrices versus when, when can you get away with like full traces? So, so you see, uh, I'm not using the tensor product. I'm saying this tensor product does not work to define locality, you should use this definition of locality. And you see that there is no tensor product here. I um, so, uh, was saying also, uh, this definition of reduced density matrix doesn't work. You need to use this one. There's no tensor product here. OK, so so what I'm, what I'm saying, first of all, my answer is this, that to get to this theorem, you don't need to. Uh, you don't need to talk about the tensor product at any stage. However, uh, you are right that, generally speaking, this does raise the question of: uh, of uh, is there a tensor product structure here? For instance, uh, here is uh, Alice. Here is Bob. Um, uh, what's the state space here? Well, it's. It's not just the tensor product of Alice's Hilbert space and Bob's Hilbert space because there are also these edges. So where should I place them and stuff? And these kinds of, you know, these kinds of, um, this is a very uh, troublesome area that we, I believe, we have really sorted out in this paper. But uh, yeah, you're right. It goes. It it uses some kind of a new tensor product. Uh, and uh, it's non-Cartesian. So the way it works is that you have some kind of a discriminating function that tells you what should go to the left and what should go to the right of your um, of your tensor. Sure. I, I mean, I, I guess. Okay. The, the reason I ask is even though, of course, your the, the the formal definitions you've stated of um, locality and, uh, and and this uh, reduced density matrix don't explicitly involve a tensor product, but kind of conceptually there is a tensor product somewhere underneath, right? Because when you're partially tracing out over subsystems, those subsystems have to have been composed in some way. When you when you get a density matrix rather than a state vector. That has to be because there was a non-zero entanglement monotone associated with the subsystems, etc. So you, you, your, your. There, there is a kind of implicit non-Cartesian tensor product structure, and what I'm, I guess, what I'm asking is, is that the same as the tensor product structure that you define in the second paper? Um, Are these yes, notions? Yes. I mean, to make the first paper work, you have to actually switch to the formalism of the second paper. There was something. Uh, a bit wrong in the first paper, so so even though yeah so so yeah so you need to <coughs> yeah you need this other tensor product. Uh, you want me to define it? I could I could define it for you right now, but I need to switch slides. I, I think the, we, the, sorry, I, I don't want to like um, take the talk off track, but we can. Yeah, yeah I think I think we can take that as as read now and and maybe come back to that at the end yeah? otherwise you lose the, the thread here okay well i was almost finished though uh i was just wrapping up so um i was saying that superpositions of graphs they are wild objects in particular it's not very clear uh, what locality causality means etc and what we've managed to do is put together definitions of locality, causality, reduced density matrix, uh, and even um, um, of, of tensor, of generalized kind of notion of, of tensor, so that all of these uh, new updated generalized definitions, they work. And they work in the sense that they, they, they hold hands and uh, all the logical interrelations that we, that we are used to them having, 
they still have. Uh, so that I could have gone deeper into, but I would have needed more time. It's like almost a, another talk. I gave uh, this talk actually uh, at Perimeter um, <coughs> last week or, or something like that. And so here is the reference of the talk if you want to find it on the web. Uh, the point also is that, yeah, so causal operator, operators over graphs, we can show that they decompose into local uh, graph rewritings. And so if it's a unitary operator, it decomposes into unitary graph rewritings mm -hmm. and so on. And um, so we are kind of wondering what to do with that. Like for instance, we are exploring some of some concrete uh, rules uh, and trying to see whether uh, this, uh, this um, quantum causal graph dynamics will, uh, will grow the graph or not, or at what speed, etc. Uh, but it's kind of a hard topic because these things are very hard to simulate. Uh, if you do it in Python, you can do, um, you can do six um, steps of time. And if you do it on a huge cluster of supercomputers, you can do 10 steps of time. So, <laughs> so and um, OK. And um, the, the thing that I'm most interested to do um, uh, when interacting with uh, this particular community, the reason why I wanted to, to give this talk is that um, I wonder about how to um, enumerate these kinds of uh, objects, these kinds of, uh, uh, of quantum causal graph dynamics. And enumerating means being able to sort of enumerate all of these k's here. And what do you know about these k's? Well, you know that there are unitary operators that rewrite disks, but you also know that they commute. They commute with one another. Uh, did, did I say that some, at some point? Yeah, they, are, they, are, they commute with one another. Uh, it doesn't matter the order in which you update these, um, these nodes. And so looking for local operators on graphs that commute, of course, has a strong flavor of, uh, of looking for for strong confluence in uh, graph rewriting systems. And um, yeah, very much would like to know what's uh, available on that topic. That's it, I'm, uh, I'm finished. Hey, thank you very much. That was instructive, so I, yeah, I learned a lot. So maybe I can just start and then we can pick up questions from the, the audience just in so my, I'm trying to understand the perspective here, which is different from what we usually look at if we start from a rule-based point of view. So you're looking at functions between graphs, essentially, uh, which you don't make any particular assumptions on apart from the locality. Um, so, but, but you, you don't talk about how they are implemented in a sense. Um, and then the question is, how can I break this down into local operations? On, on, on graphs that, that then obviously by their properties satisfy this, this causality um, requirement. So, so we would normally go the other way around, as you are probably aware, in the sense that we start from rules and the, rule, the rules are obviously local operations yeah, because they have local contexts that they, that they work on um, and do local changes. Um, so you have this kind of limited radius that they can that they can uh, act on automatically built in because it's a finite pattern that you that you have in the in the left hand side, um, and then we study the if you like the functions between graphs that arise from these local rules. So it's a kind of dual uh, uh, perspective, I, I would say. And and specifically for the confluence, I mean, we would start with a set of rules and ask if this set of rules is is, is confluent. Um, you are asking, if I understand correctly, can you enumerate confluent set of rules, for example, or, or can, can you enumerate sets of rules that have certain specific um, properties? And I'm not entirely sure whether you, you start with the function 
or whether you just implement sort of sets of rules or, or, or maybe maybe individual rules such that they would generate functions with those properties that you're interested in. Um, but so, um, so I mean, I think you're just trying to, to, to well. I, I agree with everything you said. And, um, and um, I would say that uh, I'm, you know, I, I went the other way around maybe, but I kind of reached the same place. Uh, and therefore now I, I'm indeed interested in, in working out candidate KUs here. So mm -hmm. candidate local rules. But sorry, just, just to, 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 to understand this more precisely. So, so you're not fixing the F, you're not looking for, for a given F for, for, for the case, but the question is what are, yeah, as you say, candidate case that you could then use to implement whatever F you, you, you need. Yeah, to explore the spaces, the space of Fs, yeah. Okay, okay. And yeah, okay. So um, Nick, Nick, um, please. Right. Uh, thanks a lot, Pablo. Very interesting. I, I, I re-raise my question. <laughs> Sorry, because uh, during the talk, um, because it's exactly, I mean, the, the question of whether you're, whether you're actually working over Hilbert space is really essential. So, I mean, you chose a variant where rather than working over isomorphism classes of finite graphs, which would have been a choice, you work over the groupoid, uh, essentially, of finite uh, graphs, where you basically say per possible enumeration of labels on, on the graph drawn from a finite set, you admit um, all the possible repermutations in a sense. So basically you, you, you are working over a space which is I mean, larger, of course, than if you were to work over isomorphism classes. But I claim that um, presumably, or at least for a subset of your, of your examples, this should be, there should be a one-to-one -one mapping in the sense that, uh, I mean, we are, we are currently developing a version of double pushout and other writing techniques exactly on groupoids. So, so basically, because if you, if you think about it, if you construct a pushout, for example, a gluing of graphs, you exactly can sort of freeze the degrees of freedom in, in, in the pushout object if you do define this as an operation <laughs> on the groupoid. Yes, because you essentially do have universal isomorphisms, but I mean, you can fix uh, the label set. And so my suspicion is that if one is maybe looks at um, the implementations of some of your local rewrites, I suppose there would be a theory um, arising that describes everything in terms of graph transformation rules seen as acting on the Hilbert space of isoclasses. Because I mean, for example, what you're writing here, we can do in rule algebra as exactly, you know, the action of the representation of one particular local rule on a state. So, I mean, I, I think this is worthwhile exploring. So I think I, I, I... I can answer this quite precisely. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, uh, I mean, basically, the difference is, is between classical, whether reversible, doesn't matter, or quantum. In the reversible case, we also have theorems that show that whether you have name, whether you don't have names, whether you have, an, you have a, a, a pointed graph, so you don't have names, but there is a single out origin. All of these things are equivalent. Okay. But in the quantum mechanical uh, setting, something else and a bit strange is happening. And I can give you a, a, a good intuition of, of what the problem is. Mm -hmm. So here is the problem. <laughs> Imagine that you are um, a particle mm -hmm. uh, in an empty space, in an empty universe. So for instance, ah, you could model this as just a circle of nodes and there is one particle here. Mm -hmm. And um, a quantum particle, what it can do is that it can move right, but it may also move left. And it may, in fact, move right and left in a superposition. OK? So now the thing is, uh, what do you want to do now? So you have to describe a situation where there is this circle. And the particle is in a superposition of being there in the circle and there in the circle because it moved. In the so, so maybe if I can quickly comment on that. So far, we would be agreeing. So this would be in rule algebra. You would have simply an actual uh, Hilbert space superposition of the two states. So far, we would be in agreement. Okay. Yes. 
But now so this, is not, this is not un uncommon. Yeah. My point is that if the graphs are modulo isomorphisms, whether you move left in empty space or move right in empty space, you don't see it because you're in empty space. So this. Yeah, yeah but exactly. And now, so right my now. question was more precisely: in putting all the axioms together that you have, for, um, would it then turn out that by the axioms that you have, it is impossible to actually see this distinction? From the mathematics because we are talking about all transitions so we never talk about an individual rewrite we talk about all possible rewrites from a state and so the question is whether if you take that into account is it even possible to produce your contradiction because here you're assuming somehow i can speak individually on that state space not for the rule but on the actual hilbert space i can speak individually of individual rules um so my, my claim is that presumably what you're telling us is that if we because we you have to implement a unitary uh, sorry, you have to implement a certain type of operator. And I, I think it, I'm only saying that it would be worthwhile to look at, for example, in this example, you, you, you can have a directed graph to implement a direction. Yes. So certainly you can have two different states that go back and forth. So that would be marked. It's just that the question is whether the circle is such, it's really um, where the position really matters globally, or whether in the Hilbert space you have, this is indistinguishable. Yes. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I mean, we we can maybe go deeper in, into that. Uh, yeah, we should draw uh, something. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's a question that that can take us far. But, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, but basically, it's this question where if you want to superpose the guy that went left and went right, but the space itself it doesn't it it is completely symmetrical. So there's nothing to tell you whether it went left or right. Uh, you don't yeah. Then to... and and then the question becomes: Is that operator that you write? Does it, I mean, if you mathematically pin down the details of that operator and of that Hilbert space, I claim that presumably we end up at a similar situation because basically it is impossible to write down an operator that could observe the difference between two symmetric situations. I, I, I wonder whether under the constraints you're putting, it's even possible to write right, down an observation that is- The thing is you can, you can, you can. Um, so we have a precise example where uh, the quantum walk is a Hadamard walk. Mm -hmm. And you look at two steps, and if you are in a sort of empty space and you and you identify every position with every position, you will find that you are always. Oh no no sorry we are in a groupoid yes so we don't identify we we have an action of an isomorphism maybe that's a misunderstanding we're we're talking about something which is in homotopy theory yes we are talking about where you can where, where the two positions are linked by a by the action. Of uh, of a permutation, so you do not have you have a path between those. Um, we we are not talking freely about equating them. Sorry, maybe that's a misunderstanding. But it's not uh, just um, cla isomorphism classes of graphs. Then it has no, no. I'm talking about a version of this uh, which works on group. Sorry, maybe that was a misunderstanding. There is a version of this where you actually take into account the groupoid structure of finite graph of graph writing. Where, where you basically do have this uh, witness of uh, the permutation between two isomorphic graph. Ah, okay. Okay, and anyways, so maybe let's discuss that in the offline discussion. I don't want to take all the time. So okay. uh, thanks for now, and maybe we can discuss the Hadamard example then later. Jonathan, do you want to go ahead? Sure, yeah. So again, thanks, Pablo. It was a, it was a great talk. Um, so I wanted to ask a bit about this sort of um, the, the, the name preserving nature of the operations in the second paper as a kind of generalization of vertex preservation in the first paper. So, so my understanding is that um, you can get around the vertex preservation problem by introducing these kind of split and merge operations on vertices that, that are known to be name preserving up to our algebraic closure. And then that means that if you define this restriction map, you can still have you can still, you know, have consistent notions of locality and causality, uh, even where, you know, even where, the, where your vertex sets are, are not are not, you know, not strictly preserved. Um, but one thing I'm kind of curious about is uh, whether the splitting and merging operations are known to be the most general, or if they, if, if it's just known that they, uh, that they can be introduced without breaking, uh, without breaking name preservation, or, or I mean. Do we know explicitly that there aren't other operations that could be done that would introduce or, or, or subtract away vertices, but still would preserve your notion of locality? Um, so uh, it's a very good question. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, 
that I know how to answer that. Um, I understand the question, although I think you will need to formalize it a bit more because, um, okay, so in that paper, we have this, this algebra over, over names, right? Where you can uh, split and merge names. Uh, it's, it's a kind of algebraic structure about the way we, we name stuff. Right. Right. So that's something we kind of uh, postulate for our formalism. So in a sense, um, there's nothing beyond that because that's all the formalism we have. Uh, so, so in that sense, uh, I could say trivially, uh, yeah, there's nothing else. Now, could we have invented an even, uh, an even larger formalism? I don't know, because I think the, the argument for that is very general. So let me just, I, I need to switch slide to answer your question. Uh, so let me do that. Uh, oh, so one second. Okay, but perhaps I can, while you're doing that, perhaps I can say a little bit about wh why I'm interested in that particular question and its relation to the, the, your co the comments you made uh, towards the end about global confluence. So in the kinds of uh, sort of graph rewriting systems that, that sort of my group has been investigating, uh, we've been looking at kind of the tensor product structure of graph rewrites, right? So, so you, you have, uh, you know, you, you look at step sequences or something in some graph transformation system, and uh, that those step sequences are equipped with a tensor product structure. You can get a monoidal category out of it. Um, and then there's also causal relationships between those, between those sequences, and they equip it with a kind of two category structure. Um, and rather interestingly, there are special cases in which we know that uh, preservation of the causal structure under different choices of rewriting order are, is, is equivalent to global confluence. It's not true in general, but it's true for some special cases. And one of the cases in which we know that it's true is where, we're, is where one has strict preservation of vertices. Um, but it seems like what you've done with, with, you know, with this notion of, of name preservation up to algebraic closure is introduce a slightly wider class of, of operations that aren't strictly vertex preserving, but which still have some of the properties that we'd expect such a system to, to, to satisfy. And so I'm kind of wondering, you know, your notion of, of what it means for A to be a, a, a chi-local operator, um, you, you know, Clearly, splits, splittings and mergings are generators of that of that algebra, but are they, you know, are they known to be the most general generators, or could there exist other ones? Okay, so I mean, I, <coughs> I'm interested to to know about the, the results you're describing. Huh? Um, it sounds sounds very good, um, but let me answer the what I can answer about. Uh, ah. Sorry, that's not, that's not the right presentation, sorry. Um, damn. Um, why? Can you see my slides here? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. So imagine that you have a unit tree that is going to take one node <coughs> u into two nodes. So you kind of face the difficulty here of how you're going to call that second node because, uh, because uh, you may call it v or w, but uh, how do you choose that? I and mean, particularly if you want to be local, how, how do you choose it? Because you just you don't know if v was taken somewhere else in the graph and, and so on. So what I'm saying is that I think that it's pretty much without loss of generality that we can posit that u, the unitary operator, is going to take node u into u dot l and u dot r. So yeah, at that moment, at that stage, I think I'm not saying much. You know, I'm just saying you need to have a name that's fabricated from u and a name that's fabricated from R, okay? So I don't think I'm, I'm, uh, I have a loss of generality at this stage. Now, as a consequence of that, let's consider U dagger. U dagger is a guy that takes two nodes 
and it merges them into one node. If you want to be unitary, you are bound to construct a name for the new node, which has to be a, a, a bijection. A, uh, it has to be bijective with respect to the to the previous names. So you're bound to call this something like V merge W. And that is, uh, I think you have no choice. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, okay. And then after that, you suddenly realize that if you apply U dagger in this case, well, it gives you U dot L merge with U dot R, but it also should be U and therefore you derive this equality. And similarly, you realize that when you take this node and you apply U, uh, you get a splitting, <coughs> but this should be V and this should be W, and therefore you should have this equality. So the argument I made here, I think is very, very general. And in that sense, I think that um, this um, splitting and merger operators in the name algebra, uh, I don't, I think they are, they are the most general thing you can have. Um, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's what I can say, I think. Okay, so, so sh at the level of vertices, I, I agree. That is the most general thing you could do. Um, but given that your construction induces the edge, you know, induces everything about the edges from the names of the vertices, uh, it seems it doesn't seem obvious to me that it's the most general construction on the edges. If it makes <coughs> no, sense. I agree. I think uh, there are other ways to encode the edges um, on the graph. You need to be super careful the way you do it. And in fact, in the same paper, maybe you didn't. You, I see that you re, you read it very well, and I, I thank you a lot for your interest. Uh, but I don't know if you went up to the last page, page forty, where we actually propose another way of uh, of encoding the these edges. So no, I agree with you that perhaps uh, relying on this merge split structure for the edges may not be mandatory. Okay, interesting. We, 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 yeah, let me not hold up the conversation, but I, I'd be really interested to discuss more with you later. Okay, great. Okay, any more questions? Oh yeah, uh, Clemens, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Pablo, for condensing so much conceptual, uh, interesting into, so crisp slides. So I thank you very much for that. I fear I just have a very naive question, namely uh, concerning the non-quantum stuff, uh, your example concerning the realization of the shift. And you used there that the uh, transformation is yeah, bijective or one, one uh, uh, invertible. Uh, and I was just wondering very naively, is that they're really necessary? Because I would naively even think perhaps one can use infinitely many rules to, to uh, still come up with rules for a causal system in your definition. This is a naive question. I have not looked into the details. So, um, so if you're studying reversible cellular automata, maybe it's because you you believe in reversibility, like you think uh, right. uh, yeah. mechanics is reversible, or yeah. maybe you will you have less power consumption if you are reversible, and yes. so on. So, so then, if you decompose it uh, into local mechanisms, you you want these mechanisms to be themselves local, and that is where where the the, the complication starts. I mean, the, the, this is what becomes difficult in the yes. in the proof because. Otherwise, it, okay, it's a reversible cellular automata, so it has a it has a local transition function like every cellular automata. So there is already a local mechanism, but it's not reversible. Um, so in the unitary setting, same thing. I mean, you have a global unitary operator, and now you want to decompose it into small stuff, but they need to be unitary, right? So I think um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's mainly the 
but that if the rules do not have to be unitary themselves, could then your result be generalized to a situation where the transformation that you look at is also not invertible? But if that leads too far, then I stop immediately. Wait, you mean, <coughs> so if the, if the, yeah, what, something that can happen is that you have a cellular automata uh, where I give you a local transition function and this local transition function doesn't look um, like anything. I mean, like it's reversible or anything. For, for, forgets information or so. Yeah, but actually it turns out that if you apply it synchronously and everywhere and you, and you, you, know, you, you, you look at your global uh, evolution, that global evolution is a bijection. That can happen. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that was exactly what you were saying, but... Um... Uh, th thank you in any case. So I think I will look at <laughs> your uh, uh, paper in more detail. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, so thanks for that then. So then maybe we can um, bring the official part to a conclusion here. Um, so thank you very much again, Pablo, for your, for your nice talk and everyone else for engaging and discussing and, and, and listening, of course. Um, Nick, do you want to say quickly what happens in two weeks' time? Yes, uh, in two weeks we have, uh, sorry, first of all, also thanks a lot, Pablo. And uh, just for everybody still on YouTube, uh, you can switch over into the Zoom meeting if you're interested. We, we should stay on for another, I think, at least half hour or so. Um, and next week we have uh, uh, two weeks, we have Arthur Boronat talking about um, the topic in, I think, uh, model engineering. Um, yes, and it's, on, use, it's already announced use, on the website. We use a model-based yes. software engineering. Exactly, program. yes. So I will just uh, switch off the YouTube stream now. Everybody can stay on the Zoom meeting who wishes to still discuss. And thanks also to our, our audience on YouTube.